production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, the Columbus Museum of Art celebrates the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance with its latest exhibit. I knew I wanted this exhibit to be heavy on writers because I'm a writer. Watch as Tibetan monks painstakingly create and destroy an intricate work of art made from sand and a studio performance by the Salty Caramels. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, happy Thanksgiving, and thank you for spending part of your day with Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Our first stop tonight is the Columbus Museum of Art. Their current exhibition is part of a citywide celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance, a cultural movement that extended far beyond the New York neighborhood in which it was born. Award-winning author, biographer, and Columbus native, Will Haygood, who curated the show, tells us how important and exciting this moment in time really was. This was a very, very, very unfair, unjust, uh, wretched country for blacks who wanted to express uh, um, uh, their art. The real meat of the Harlem Renaissance went from about 1920 to 1930. It was just this great artistic reaction to all of the racism and hardships that American soldiers saw during World War I when they were overseas. So their mindset was, uh, how come the French and the Italians treat us much better than we are treated uh, back in the United States of America? And here we are uh, fighting for the freedom of our home country. And so when all of these soldiers came back into their communities, there had been a lot of essays and articles written about the desire uh, for black patriots uh, to support the arts and to express uh, uh, this genius that had been ignored for so long. So you had this movement that grew out of bloodshed in a war that all of a sudden now could be symbolized with music, dance, theater, literature, uh, book writing. Uh, and, and that's how it sort of started to flourish in the early 1920s. It is the one artistic movement that is undeniable in the maturation, political, economically, socially and definitely artistically of this country. That's why Harlem Renaissance art hangs in the White House. That's why Harlem Renaissance art is celebrated in Canada and France and Germany. It's just an undeniable recognition of a great moment in this country. James Van Der Zee started out sort of taking ordinary photographs of black folk in Harlem. Wedding pictures, social teas, things of that nature. And so he starts really, really falling in love as well with the Harlem Renaissance that's all circulating around him. Poets are over there and musicians are over there and novelists are over there and dancers are over there, and politicians are over there. And he says, whoa, this really is amazing. I have to get my camera going. And so he was the first photographer 
who really recognized that this movement needed to be captured. Just knowing that he had the sensibility uh, to capture this moment is just astonishing. The best time and life and look photographers had nothing on James Van Der Zee. And there were magazine editors who were progressive uh, and who wanted this unique, explosive, black, artistic voice to be heard. One of the writers, Arna Bontemps, wrote a letter to Langston Hughes and he said, Harlem these days seems like, quote, a foretaste of paradise. That's how amazing it all was. I knew I wanted this exhibit to be heavy on writers because I'm a writer. One of the great things about the Harlem Renaissance is that these writers and these artists uh, had a real sense that they were doing something unique. And thank God they saved their first drafts or second drafts or third drafts. They saved their letters. All of those little maps to artistic creativity were fascinating to me. Art helps, I think, soften the humanity in us all. And so were it not for this movement, other art movements might not even have sprang up. I mean, the Harlem Renaissance gave women, gave uh, impoverished people uh, all over this country uh, a hint of just what you can do if you want to put your art on the line. And it's all they really wanted is to show America that if you give us a fair chance, we will produce greatness. From that movement, they have stitched the black American forevermore into the artistic fabric of this country. And that's a tall order to imagine it and then to execute it. I Too Sing America is on view at the Columbus Museum of Art through January 20th. Visit columbusmuseum.org to learn more. And visit cbusharlem100.org to see all the ways the city is celebrating 100 years of the Harlem Renaissance. Last month, a group of Tibetan monks visited Dublin to create a mandala. They spent five days in millions of grains of colored sand to create an elaborate sand painting, only to ceremoniously destroy it when they were finished. This artistic process is a spiritual one, meant to symbolize the impermanence of all living things. Well, we're in Kaufman Park in Dublin. Um, what's happening behind us is the monks from Drepung Losling Monastery are creating a sand mandala. And it's just an open process where you can view the creation of, of, of art before your eyes. Our monastery plays a major role uh, in terms of uh, preserving culture, preserving Tibetan language, you know, Buddhism and so forth. And so this uh, mandala is called Avalokiteshvara, Buddha of Compassion. Before the mandala t starts to take shape, they need to bless the um, environment and sort of bring in the um, bring in the good energy. So they brought out horns and um, symbols, and it was just a full celebration of, of life. At the beginning of you know constructing mandala, we do some 
chants and meditations and the recitations. At the same time, we offer the sounds to the different Buddhas, and specifically this, in this case, the Buddha of Compassion. This takes a couple days, actually four days, to realize. So um, it's a real painstaking process, and um, it just takes a lot of care and precision. This tool we call it japu. We fill the, uh, this japu with scents first, and then we begin released uh, scent uh, making vibration. Well, I think this is the sort of the strange uh, concept that life is in permanence and change and so the sand is swept away and the design is destroyed. So we hope uh, people come here and see mandala and we hope it mandala can inspire them you know, to learn their end of life. You know, we forget that, right? So everything you know we plan and all like we're planning like we live forever but it's kind of a reminder of that there is an end of life. Learn more about all the programs and events sponsored by the Dublin Arts Council at DublinArts.org. Their current gallery exhibit is Color Therapy, a group show featuring the work of the Art Quilt Alliance, a group of Central Ohio fiber artists. It's on view through December 21st. Our music series continues this week with a performance by the Salty Caramels, whose name is an homage to Jenny's signature and my favorite ice cream flavor that we all love so much. The quartet is well known in Columbus for its three-part harmonies, old school vibe, and catchy indie pop tunes. Here they are performing safe in the WOSU studios.
sick for the ground Get in the car, drunk after dark And they're speeding you home, you're afraid Wondering who is this maniac That I trust with my life in the night So late Learn more about the band at thesaltycaramels.net and we've got more videos from their studio performance as well as a Q&A with the members on our site at wosu.org slash local tunes. Our final story comes to us from Sacramento, California. There, a mother-daughter team turns cherished memories into huggable keepsakes for families to remember their loved ones. There's just so much meaning behind what we do. It, just gives us it makes us feel good, it makes them feel good, and it's a win-win situation. We create custom memory bears. And we also do novelty bears and memory pillows as well. Most of the bears that Jenny and her mom Susie create by hand are the memory bears, which are made to remember the passing of a loved one. I don't know if anybody ever gets closure from a loved one passing away, but um, the memories, what we, we hope is it brings up all those happy memories for all the times that they did get to spend together. The memory bears are made with a special kind of material. We're actually using someone's personal items that have a ton of meaning. The item could be a shirt or a dress the person used to wear. It is tucked away, and it's something that you do forget. So if you take that shirt and you do make it into a bear, it's something that you can physically hold and love and see each day. With each bear, there's such a story, and that's really what we wanted, is to keep the stories going. The story behind this bear is Jenny and Susie's story. It's the bear that started it all. They call him their pop-pop bear. Pop-Pop is my husband's grandfather, and he had five great-grandchildren. He just had such a spitfire personality, and you just couldn't help but just to just he love him. So lovable. I, he was so <laughs> lovable. He was so lovable. For me personally, you know, marrying into the family, he instantly made me feel like I was his granddaughter, and we had a really deep connection. And so uh, when he passed, um, we just really wanted to do something special for all, especially the great-grandchildren. And so um, that's where we came up with the idea of getting some of his shirts and putting bears together uh, for all the great-grandchildren. Once we uh, made our first bear uh, for Papa, we had close friends actually in the neighborhood that had seen the bears, and they thought, you know, we really would love to have 
memories of our grandparents or our parents or loved ones that we've lost. And so we just kind of thought, well, okay, maybe we can do this for other people and, you know, help them as well. Hi. Nikki has had several bears made by Jenny and Susie. My dad got sick, unfortunately, and passed away from pancreatic cancer last year. I had um, asked my stepmom for some of his clothing to be able to make into bears. He's actually wearing the shirt and then holding my daughter when she was about four months old. One of the other things that I really loved that they're able to do is match the eye color. My dad, like me, he had green eyes. She also had a bear made in honor of her grandmother. The material came from my grandmother's wedding dress and the lace that are on the feet and the ears came from the top of her dress. The buttons that we have here are from the back of her wedding dress, and then they were able to incorporate some of the beadwork that we have here. Um, we made that into a little necklace, and that came from the top of my grandmother's wedding dress as well. So for us, my grandma. It was such that raw emotion that um, at the beginning of starting our business that really we just kind of looked at each yeah. other like this is why we do what we do. It really makes us feel like we're helping someone through um, a, difficult, a time. difficult time in their lives. We've always been really, really close um, and best friends. Top on it. For we have so much fun. It's for me personally. It's a bucket list to be able to to work with her. It makes it more fun when you share it with somebody that you love, and hopefully giving her something for the future too of being able to carry on and, you know, make a, keep making a business out of it and being oh, able to me. be at home with the kids and, you know, give her an opportunity to, to do that. First, Hen comes in. Happy birthday, little bear, she says. And what would Pop Pop think of all this? He would just be tickled and so proud. I mean, proud would be the word. For sure, so. And take all the credit, which he deserves. Yeah, he did. <laughs> well, that's our show. You can check out all of our stories at WOSU.org or by downloading our free WOSU public media mobile app. Of course, you can always find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing the show today with more music by the Salty Caramels. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Dishes in the kitchen, leave the beds to be made. It's just too nice of a night not to drink some beer and lemonade. I like lots of sugar, you like hops and barley. We like from porch sitting, singing songs with Molly. Watch the evening glow, sipping nice and slow. Better than Sunday drinking beer and lemonade. Put some vinyl on the plate. Let the music make you sway. Darling. Thanks for watching us through your trip to Van Coma. Beer and lemonade. So when I'm doing cookies, I'm, I'm baking and decorating as Alex. So I'm selling delicious cookies that are decorated, custom, to whatever party event you're having. When I'm doing cookie decorating parties, I'm hopefully selling a fun experience where I come in drag. We're decorating cookies and I'm teaching you techniques, how to, how to flood your cookies, pipe your cookies, how to do all those fun things, so hopefully you can do some of the same things that I do. Hello Kate, welcome Hi. to the kitchen. Thank you. So we're going to make some royal icing. Okay. So for people who don't know what royal icing is, we have confectioner sugar, meringue powder, water, and whatever extract you want. I think a lot of people think making homemade icing is difficult, and they'd rather buy the tub. Yeah. It's so easy. It's really not that, and tastes better. So I wanted to do um, cookie decorating parties in drag, and it's something that no one else has done or is doing that I know of. 
So when you do cookie parties, do you bring everything? You show up with I all do. the icing and the cookies. Oh yeah. So basically, um, all the host has to do is have the space, have mm -hmm. like a placemat essentially for each person, mm -hmm. and I bring all the tools to make it happen. How fun! What I'm going to show you is we're going to touch it down while we're squeezing, lift up about like an inch, and then you're going to go around. Let's it's going to create like a really even string. Okay. okay. So you touch down. Touch it down. Lift it up. Lift it up. And nice and slow. Look at you. Home mm -hmm. stretch. Well, then... Boom. Ah! Nailed it. Did it. So then, when or after you do like that, the outer layer, you can pretty much go to just town. Just wiggle in, and you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it, it looks just perfect. Yours is gonna look like that. Oh my gosh. No way. All right. Okay. So so you tighten the bag. You're ready tighten to squeeze. Bag, ready to squeeze, and just let go of it. Yeah. They both look perfect. How easy was that? Rubbing off on me. I love it. This has been the most fun in the world. These cookie parties must be so much fun. I think they're fun. I have I a lot of fun. Nice Put on some music, right? some cookies. Best day ever. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for showing me these thank tips. Thank you for coming and doing of course, it. I'm happy to. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.